Do you know what? They did a survey of young people um, recently, and in that article, it said that 50% of young people, when, when they asked what they wanted to grow up to be, was to be famous, to be a celebrity. That was their life goal. 50% of young people, when they were asked very recently, I want to be famous. I want to be on celebrity, get me out of here. I want to be rich. I want to be powerful. Um, they, and in this story today, I, well, actually, I'll tell you recently, there's one of our church congregation here was meeting with, um, was asked to come into Luton Football Club. H- how did Luton Football Club do recently? 2-1. Two, 2-1. One. Two, one. It's very exciting. We're out of the bottom. Do you notice? We're out of the bottom three. There's a chance we might not get relegated. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming. It's good. But actually, as this person was brought into Luton FC, they, they said that some of the young people who are training, you know, they have decided that they are wanting to live for a higher purpose than for celebrity and for money and for fame. They want to get the best they can at football, but they want to do it for God's glory and God's honor. That was some of the young people who are coming through the academy and they've noticed something different about these young people because they don't want to live for money. They don't want to live for power. They don't want to have a golden statue. They want to live for God. And actually that's making them better people, but also better footballers. Isn't that cool? You see, we need the right purpose. And in this story today, we're going to find someone who power and celebrity has gone to their head. In in Daniel chapter 2, you see King Neb had been told by Daniel, you are that golden head. You're this king of all the nations. You are the, the, the great king of all these nations. And God had raised up King Nebuchadnezzar to be this awesome king of over the whole of present-day Iraq, over that whole Middle Eastern area. And he was an all-powerful, almighty king, but that power had gone to his head. I wonder if you've ever noticed that. I remember when some people at school were given for a moment, you are now a prefect. (laughs) Have you ever seen that? Uh, that power went to their head. Actually, still one of my friends, I became a senior prefect in our school, and the power went to my head. I was now the all-powerful senior prefect. And one of my mates, Wally, who I'm still, Wall, Alistair his name is, but his middle name is Wallace, and so he is still Wall. Um, He came and he barged through the lunch queue, and so I said, Wall, you will have a chit. And he completely ignored me. He ignored the power and the authority that I was wielding. He kept it for years and would waft it at me for months. I think you're a prefect. <laughs> you see, this power had gone to my head and I uh, needed to be humble and wise in the use of that power. But I wasn't going to be nepotistic. That's a good word. Ask your parents about that one. It's a good word. Um, in the use of that power. Now, Tol- I don't know if you've ever read any of Tolkien's books. Anyone read Tolkien? Yeah. Oh, don't you love Tolkien? That's a big theme in his book is, can we, with power, he says, actually, I think it's Spider-Man, he says, with great power comes. You see, that's true. With power comes great responsibility. Um, And we need to learn. See, power so easily can go to our heads. And so this is what happened. King Nebuchadnezzar had set up this huge golden statue most probably of himself but God is looking to raise up people who are humble who are broken who know their weaknesses and their need of God and God wants to raise up a generation of young people of men and women of God who are humble in his hands God raises up the humble and brings the proud to naught That is the God we worship. And he loves to take us and to use us, to raise us up in our nation, to raise us up in our schools, in our places of work, to have an influence for the king of kings. And in this story, we find three young people, young teenagers, 
They might be a little bit older by this stage. Shadrach and Meshach and off to bed we go. No, it's Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Um, I'm not very good at pronouncing. And he wanted to reveal through these young people God's majesty, his sovereignty and his divine power to rescue and to save. And it was through their willingness to stand up for what they believe to stand up for God, that God was able to reveal his glory in the nation and across the nations. You see, these young teenagers had known, as we saw in Daniel chapter 1, to draw, where to draw the line in the small things. When it came to food, the food laws, they worked out, I need to make my stance here. You know, when we at work in the small things say, Actually, I'm not going to use this photocopier for my personal use. I'm going to do my work well even when the boss walks out the door. I'm going to work because actually God is watching me and I am living for him and for his glory. Those are the moments where in the small things we know where to draw the line. And as we learn where to draw the line in the small things in Daniel chapter 1, we may get entrusted to to know that we've got to stand in the big things and at the big moments. And here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get called to stand up for what they believe when it is really tough, when the cost is really high and the pressure is really on. And so King Neb, he sets up this huge and golden statue. We have different golden statues You know, I mean, his golden statue was 90 foot high. Ours are sort of nine inches, and they're called an Oscar. I quite like an Oscar, really. I don't think I'm going to win one. You know, but don't we? We we, we value celebrity, and we put them up on a little pedestal. And it's a very dangerous thing. But this huge golden statue, 90 foot high. And King Neb said this, when... The music plays, everyone of every nation, every tribe and tongue under my authority need to kneel down and worship the golden statue. Would you, at that moment, would you choose to refuse what the leader of the nations tells you to do? Would you refuse to worship and bow down to the idol? You see, the idols in our generation are much more subtle than this. And that's why they so often sneak up on us and take hold of us. And we need to see the idols in our day and we need to be careful to not bow down to them. We're told in the New Testament that greed is idolatry and we are swamped by consumerism all of the time. We're marketed to continuously. Will we bow down to money and the love of it or will we worship the living God? It's much more subtle, but it is a similar choice and it's a choice we can make every day. In the men's group today, we were saying, actually, I'm going to give us a chance to do this. We were saying that our phones, that actually these can, they're good if we use it for a good purpose. But actually, when they take up so much of our time and that they are marketing to us so much stuff, they can become an idol and they can take up the time that we could be spending face-to-face with God or face-to-face with others in fellowship and relationship and I want to invite us if this phone you know reckon two and a half hours a day is the average people spend on their phones if this is taking hold of your life and becoming an idol maybe this is a moment to come and lay it down at the end we'll we're going to lay it and say Lord I need to be face to face with you the the consumerism the greed, the immorality that pours out from us through that, I choose to not bow down and instead to go face to face with the living God and to worship you and to love you 
and to follow you. I wonder if some of the idols in our day, I'm going to give us a moment at the end, maybe to come and bring our phones at the front or to kneel at the front and to say, Lord, I choose to bow down to you and to you alone. This is what the scriptures said to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and all of your strength. That's our first calling, to love God with all of our hearts. And Exodus 20, who can tell me the first two commandments Let's see if we can do these together. I must admit, sometimes as I look, I thought, now do I know the first two? You know, I, I, I'm, first one. Yeah, close. You shall have no other gods but me. Layla, perfect. I got it wrong. You're quite right. For you shall have no other gods but me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew. No other gods, no other idols. Number two, that's a bit later on. Number two, it's interesting that the first two do not make any graven image. Definitely not a golden 90 foot image and call people to worship before it. They, they knew their God. They loved their God. The sovereign Lord, the God of the nations, the one who created all things. And when the King Jung leaders, the Putins, the Rishi Shunaks, I don't know, who might pressure us into its mold. The world wants to us to compromise and conform to the patterns of this world. Will we say No. Will we stand up for the truth, stand up for what we believe, and dare to courageously stand on God's word, whatever the cost? It means we must not bow down to this world, to the love of it, and to every idol that is subtly there within it. I was about 11 when I first heard the gospel, a little older than some of the kids here, and they could, in that meeting, I was invited to put my trust in the Lord Jesus because he had died for me and shed his blood for me. And I opened my heart and said, Lord Jesus, come into my life. You're the King of kings. You're the Lord of lords. Please come and reign in my heart. Live in me. I want to live in a way that honors you. And I, that night I sat down beside my bed on my got down on my knees and I opened my heart to the Lord Jesus and he came in and I was given a song and in that song I wrote these words Lord Lord you're the Prince of Peace Lord Lord you died for me oh Jesus I know your love is deep and wide and I invited him into my heart we're going to have one of our youngsters who's going to sing a song later that God's given to him and Layla. But it was the best decision that I made in my life, opening my heart to him. And he came in, the king of glory, came to reign in here, in my heart. And one of the teachers who was a Christian at my school, he thought it would be a great idea that I stood up in front of the whole school of 500 kids, they thought, um, and it was, you know, Share what God's done in your life. And so I got up and I sang this song in front of the whole school. I gave my testimony. And i got to tell you, I got ribbed something rotten. I got some serious grief from a few. But actually from many, I got deep respect and deep interest. And it was a great moment to learn to stand for Christ in the midst of my school, to learn to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it it started to put metal inside here. Courage to stand like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. 
Are we prepared to stand up for what we believe? And would you be prepared to give up your life even for what we believe? Now, that's a bit more edgy and a bit more courageous and challenging. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, if you haven't found something worth dying for, you haven't yet found something worth living for. What we believe is worth everything the god we worship for us to live is christ to die is glorious gain and have you found something that is worth even more than the life we have here are you prepared to stand up for what we believe and would you even be prepared to give up your life for what you believe for shadrach meshach and abednego that was the challenge Would they bow down to the world and to its idols? Or would they stand up for the living God and worship him and live for him alone? Now, there are many brothers and sisters of ours in Nigeria, in India, in Afghanistan, in Sudan, where that challenge in China where at this very moment, sometimes that challenge still comes. But that is the cost of following the Lord Jesus Christ with courageous faith. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were given this challenge. They refused, and King Nebuchadnezzar got furious. He uh, decided to put the fire and to make it a little bit uh, fervent, uh, he, he, who, who's going to come and help me light the fire? <laughs> come on, Joss. Fantastic. So, I think I've done a fu- full risk assessment. He's got a lighter. He's off with his cigars. Fantastic. Okay. So, we're going to go through here. Do you want you hold the end there? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, here we, here we go. <laughs> I'm just here to frighten children. Wow. Wow. And it got hotter and hotter. Don't do this at home, children. It's getting really hot. Seven times. I was actually going to get a little flamethrower here. I was going to get my WD-40 and make it go seven times hotter. But then I thought maybe I, that is going to be silly. Uh, but it would have been quite fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> I was going to spray. It was going to, be, it was going to be great fun. But then I suddenly thought of the whole table and the crepe paper. I did do a full risk assessment. Fantastic. And it got hotter and hotter. I read this this week in one of Tim Keller's books. Those that suffer for Christ have Christ's gracious presence with them in the suffering. Even in the fiery furnace, even in the shadow of the valley of the shadow of death. And therefore, even there, they need fear no evil. Hereby, Christ showed that what is done against his people is done against him. Whoever throws them into the furnace does indeed throw him in. I am Jesus, the one that thou persecutest. You see, when we go through the fire, God has promised to walk with us. This is what the scripture says. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Now, this is what biblical faith is. This, for me, is one of the best verses in Daniel. If you take anything away, take Daniel 3, verse 17 and 18 away with you today. For this is their courageous faith. This is what they say. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, this is young people saying this. If we're thrown into the fire, The God we serve is able to save us and deliver us. They believe in the miraculous, wonder-working, delivering, almighty God. The one who brought his people through the Red Sea. The one who fed them in the desert. 
with manna, the God who brought water out of the rock, the God of wonders, they knew that God is able to do the impossible and would even protect them from the flames. God is able to save. But even if he does not, we want you to know we will not bow down. Now that is biblical faith. Courageous faith. Some people have a sort of faith, you know, if God does a miracle for me, I'll believe it. If God makes my life easier and more comfortable, I'll believe in God. If God sort of, you know, blesses with me with abundance and all these kind of things, then I'll believe in God. No, this is biblical faith. In the God of provision, the God of miracles, the God of wonders, the God who is mightily able to save. But even if he does not, we will trust in him. I love that. We need more of that metal and faith in our hearts and we need to grow that in the hearts of our young people that they will stand for the living God in our pluralistic and morally very confused and confusing world that they will stand for the living God. So do you trust in this God? Who was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in their suffering and in the fire. Who was this God? See, some would say, I mean, I think Nebuchadnezzar is wrong where he thinks this, well, he's, got, he's starting to get there. I mean, this could be an angel. I mean, the Lego brick Bible seemed to suggest it was angel. I think the Lego brick Bible might be wrong at this point. Nebuchadnezzar is getting close when he says, one like the Son of God. When you get to Daniel 7, we're going to meet someone who is like the Son of Man, before whom all the nations will fall down and worship. We start to get to see the eternal Christ. This is Christ walking with them in the flames. The one through whom the universe was made was here in the fire with them. He has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. When Jesus stood on that Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah, you see suddenly you're out of time in glory, aren't you? You're in the presence of the living God. This is the eternal Son of God. The Lord Jesus Christ came and saved them from the fire, protected them so they weren't singed. They weren't singed. They were saved as God had promised he would God is with us in the hardships God is with us in the hardest of times I mean I know what it's like to have got that close to a knife coming past me my heart on the streets of Manchester and the Lord was with me protected me but also I knew a peace as whether I lived or died, I was in God's hands and I was safe. Do we have that kind of faith that says, Lord, I am yours. I trust in you in all the hardships, in all the trials. For he, the Lord Almighty, has said, I am with you. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Have you put your trust in the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do you know him do you love him are you prepared to stand for him are you prepared to follow him well as we come to a finish I'm going to give us a chance to respond in faith for some of us this is a moment to put down and to put away some of the things that have got hold of our hearts. This is a moment maybe to put a phone at the front. I promise I won't nick them. <laughs> but to say, Lord, I lay it down. I want more time with you. I'm sorry for the things that have got hold of me. This is a moment too, I think, for us to put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ.